interesting that you're talking about October because one of the things that the that Shijinji, they had lied about was they claimed that they took down a database at the Wuhan Institute of Virology after the pandemic had started because they were getting harassed by people who were looking into, you know, whether it was a lab leak. And they were like, we, we took this down, you know, in March or whatever. And it turned out that they actually took that database down in September right. of 2019. Right. Hmm. Interesting timeline that's coming out. Right. And so that that's another just a very key, you know, something you learn in the Intel community that when you're digging through one of these things that, you know, people there, there's so many different avenues and so many different methods of, you, you know, they say, go down, the, you know, go down this rabbit hole, go down that rabbit hole. And you can always be doing that. But laying everything out on a timeline is critical to understanding, because, again, right to your point, right? They took down if they took down that database in September of 19, um, you know, and and presumably, right, you know, this study that we're talking about, about the transgenic mice and the pathogenicity of the two bat coronaviruses would have been included in that database if it was something that they were putting raw data into. So, you know, maybe they've got international partners that are looking at this and trying to, you know, just follow the, the study as it's going along. You know, why take that down so early on? So. You mentioned timelines being important. So let me get this straight. I want to kind of lay it out as I understand it from you. In 2018, the Wuhan Institute of Virology got funding to do gain-of-function research on transgenic mice uh, to infect these sort of humanized lung cells with bat coronaviruses to try to adapt those spike proteins to uh, these humanized lungs. Uh, and that experimentation started in 2019 and January. Well, we know right? we know from the document that we've seen that it was scheduled to start in 19. And I want to be clear about this. This is not the earlier experiments that were being funded by the NIH. This was wholly funded, as far as we can tell, from the Chinese Academy of Science. So this is obviously it's building off of those previous experiments, but this was not one of the ones right, that was being tied into uh, EcoHealth Alliance and Peter Doshak and Fauci and all of these other things. This was a, a solely done um, venture from China. And is the Chinese Academy of Sciences, are they connected to the People's Liberation Army? Well, I mean, to an extent, everything in China is connected. That's why I always kind of laugh when uh, they say, oh, this this lab might have ties to the this party or this military so it's all it's all connected right so yes though on on paper we do see a, a strong connection with the chinese academy of science and many questions about chinese um china's pla bioweapons program right you you're seeing them work hand in hand on multiple programs in terms of this uh, you've seen it in the past and intelligence you know in in the best assessments that we've seen we've also considered that to be the way they run those programs, right? You're just, you're running, and, and it's the same way that classified uh, programs are run in the United States, by the way, that you're not creating a wholly separate military entity for these things, right? You're you're working hand in hand with them. You're just, you're bringing the expertise uh, of, of the scientists over, you're giving them, you know, a security clearance, and then you're setting it all up. So it might be, for example, a certain, you know, a certain wing of the Wuhan Institute or a certain room or even just certain studies that are going on that nobody else in the facility knows about if they don't have clearance or if they don't have the read in, uh, you know, need to know, I guess you would say, for that specific program. OK, so just to get this, the timeline straight here. So in 2018, funding was approved to do this kind of research on bat coronaviruses. Supposedly, it was scheduled to begin in early 2019. September of 2019, the Wuhan Institute of Virology took a bunch of related data uh, off of their database. October 2019, a bunch of foreigners traveling in China got sick with uh, mysterious respiratory disease. Uh, December 2019, uh, we started to see uh, these cases being reported by whistleblowing doctors in China. Then, like mid January 2020, after many, many weeks of, of this mysterious virus going around China, the Chinese Communist Party acknowledges that it's there, first says there's no human to human transmission, then later acknowledges, okay, well, maybe there is human to human transmission. Meanwhile, they're, they're allowing Chinese people to travel 
abroad from Wuhan to other countries with basically no uh, exit restrictions. Uh, and then basically by February and March, a whole bunch of Western countries are getting infected on a massive scale. Is that basically what, what we're seeing? 100%. And and you remember, and if you look back, by the way, so I'm talking about what's going on in Wuhan and saying, we, we, need, to down, we need to shut this down. And then, so they do it, I think the 25th is when, uh, when because Trump is still president then, so Trump does it. You have a huge response, by the way, from the Chinese diplomatic corps, uh, denying it, uh, opposing it, how dare you, don't do this. Um, you also have, by the way, where? In the country of Italy, where Italy, we know, got hit very hard with this thing early on, and they were going very strongly on Italy, even as Italy was already experiencing these massive first waves of this thing. And I think, quite frankly, I really don't think that you see Western governments, with the exception of Trump's order back in January, you really don't see Western governments getting on board with the severity of this thing until Italy hits, right? So Italy goes bad, and that's when you start seeing these you know, really strong reactions from U.S. governments um, and, and European governments talking about. And that's where you start seeing the mask mandates. That's when lockdowns, of course, are initiated, very, very draconian lockdowns very early on. It's it's Italy was that was that flashpoint, I believe. Now, you, you bring up the draconian lockdowns, the kind of lockdowns that happened in Italy and in the United States over the past, you know, year, almost year and a half now. They're unprecedented, right? The America... Even during the the 1918 flu pandemic, America never had this kind of lockdown, right? We haven't, we didn't have it during the 60s when there was a very bad and deadly flu. To what do you attribute this sort of fundamental shift in policy for how to handle a deadly pandemic uh, in terms of implementing these big lockdowns? Well, I, I I think that's pretty clear, and and Majid Nawaz has has written about this quite extensively. That this at um in the UK, that th they were copying what China was doing. They said, well, it looks like China's locking down people, so let's just do the exact same thing. Whatever the CCP prescribes is what we're going to do, right? There's no <laughs> right, and and early on, right? I'm I'm not one of those people who says um you know that I I, I think that they wanted the you know that this, this was like a plan or something like that no what i what i think it is is you know going back to what we were saying earlier about the intoxicating influence of that amount of authoritarian power that the ccp wields and seeing that they also saw that because of the health crisis this gave them the opportunity to really flex those authoritarian muscles so they said just do it just do whatever the ccp is doing whatever they're doing in wuhan just do it now of course um, I don't think there's anywhere in the West where you saw lockdowns that were quite as bad as what the CCP was doing uh, in terms of locking people into their homes and bolting them down. But you certainly see the severity of these lockdowns. And in many cases, even once we started learning more about how this virus works and started learning more about the actual data of how people are infected and who it hits harder and uh, the different effects that it has, that you you start learning about more of the efficacy of of lockdowns and there yet there's still people in the west who will cling to saying nope everybody has to lock down that's the only way uh you know we shouldn't just focus on sick people we shouldn't just focus on you know the elderly or people who have uh, pre-existing conditions you know uh, immunocompromised or immunodeficient people no it's everyone has to be locked down that's the only way to be safe the new york times was really pushing that message china had it right Right. And so we're told again and again that this is the way to do things, to follow the CCP model. They got it right. We got it wrong. We need to do whatever they did. And that's what we're told. Even though the CCP clearly is not super transparent about anything. Yeah, the question, is, and I think really the jury is still out on what exactly happened in Wuhan, not only with um, the initial outbreak of the virus, but also in terms of the response, in terms of, you know, it, it seems it seems very clear, by the way, that China had some type of treatment for this thing far earlier than they were letting on to the rest of the world. And I think that's definitely something that needs to be investigated and something that needs to be studied very, very clearly, because, you know, the rest of the world was was conducting lockdowns. You know, we were keeping people separate, et cetera, et cetera. And yet. 
um, Wuhan specifically seems to be able to go back to their um, normal levels of of work and their normal levels of activity far earlier than than other countries. And so the question is either number one, did they have a treatment early on? And I suspect they did. And then number two, did they also realize that lockdowns weren't necessarily what they needed in terms of this? They just needed to focus on specific, you know, specific people who were sick early on. Well, there's a lot of questions that have come out from this. Uh, One I want to bring up is people were encouraged to go to Wuhan and were getting sick in, what do we say, September, October 2019. We know for a fact that even as it was beginning to spread around the world, uh, China was still allowing international travel from Wuhan. And not just allowing, demanding, demanding. What do you mean by demanding? Well, that's what I'm talking about with this, uh, uh, their diplomatic efforts, right? So this huge diplomatic pushback whenever the U.S. and Italy are talking about shutting down travel. Demanding not to stop it, in a way. Right, demanding not to stop yeah. it. They're demand- you will accept Chinese air- aircraft. So what was going on? So, you know, and this is very much just my assessment kind of mode, but the way I look at things and, and look at high-level Politburo kind of strategic thinking on this is it really seems like the Politburo took a look at this situation when they finally found out what was happening, when they realized they weren't able to cover up what was happening in Wuhan, when they realized that this pandemic was, and by the way, this would uh, would work for regardless if it was lab leak or not, uh, when they realized that they had a big problem that they were going to have to show the world, you really it really starts to look as though they said to themselves, well, should this be a China problem or should this be a world problem? Because if it's a China problem, it's going to call, right, our mandate of heaven into question. It's going to call our dynastic power as the CCP, as the latest dynasty of China, in into question as to whether or not we are the legitimate rulers, the legitimate heirs to power here in Beijing and Zhongnanhai. But if it becomes a world problem and if it just becomes, oh, one of those things, you know, we live on this planet and uh, we've been, you know, fighting viruses as a, as a human species for so long, then we can deflect blame away from ourselves. And in terms of, you know, certainly the economic uh, problems that came ar- that arose because of the lockdowns and the economic issues, of course, that arose from uh, just from the pandemic itself directly. And they said, why should why should we bear the brunt of these things? Why should China be the only country that has to be hit by this? Well, if it actually works in our favor, if we can then not necessarily prevent it or not do everything we can to prevent the spread from the rest of the world, but also find ways so that we can actually spin this to work in our favor by saying, look how good we dealt with this thing versus the way the rest of the world has dealt with this thing. And that has been the New York Times narrative. That is certainly the narrative in the 1% in the West today. That's the Charlie Munger narrative. He mentions it in, in that CNBC interview, right? That's He's saying exactly what Xi Jinping wants him to say, whether he knows it or not, by the way, right? He is, uh, he is playing off the exact same sheet of music that they're playing off of in Beijing. And so You know, you really do have to wonder what some of those strategic conversations that were being had or at the highest levels were and why they made the decisions that they made. Going back to the timeline we're looking at, which doesn't seem to be making much sense if their real goal was just shutting down a worldwide pandemic. (laughs) 